coming up. Blue Origin successfully launches and lands a suborbital rocket. A series of other launches. Fire suppression. And I interview William Pomerantz of Virgin Galactic. All that and more. Stay tuned. Tomorrow begins right now. <laughs> Dramatic. Welcome to Tomorrow, episode 8.35 for Saturday, December 5th, 2015. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. Now, before we get started with our show, I'd like to give a huge shout-out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are the people who have contributed at least $10 to this episode. We are a crowdfunded show, and you can find out more information on how you can help crowdfund us over at patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. All right, uh, so I didn't cover this with anyone in advance. I totally should have, but um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Mike has our first story, but before he gets into it, um, I would like to roll, I think we should set it up by rolling the video in its entirety. So uh, here you go. Estimate 30 seconds to engine start. Twenty-five thousand feet. <laughs> Drag brakes are ready. Thirteen thousand feet AGI. Estimate ten seconds to engine start. Engine start. We have thrust. Two thousand feet. One thousand feet. 500 feet, we are coming out. 150 feet, negative seven feet per second, gear deployed. 70 feet, 50 feet, velocity steady. Touchdown. Awkward ending. So, Mike, what were we watching? Very cool. Very cool. So, that was the engineer's reaction to the successful launch and landing of sub, of, excuse me, Blue Origin suborbital rocket, the New Shepard vehicle. And with that, that occurred on, uh, excuse me, Monday, November 23rd, and they waited the next day until the 24th of November to announce it. And uh, it was it, it, very, very awesome for, for, for them to be able to do this. And with this, they were able to ascend up to 100 kilometers or 60 miles to the edge of space and release the capsule and be able to have the, the landing portion, which we, you saw. It looked like for a moment like it might have been able to tip over a little bit, but they were successfully able to recover and land successfully. Now, uh, uh, on Tuesday, uh, Jeff Bezos took to Twitter and said that this that a used rocket was a rare beast and if done right uh, it, Controlled landing not easy, but done right can look easy uh, Which prompted Elon Musk to respond reminding him that SpaceX has been doing the grasshopper uh, test flights since 2013 and that they were not Blue Origin or SpaceX neither one was the first commercial organization to have a reusable rocket since that goes to the the, the whole crew for the spaceship one. And uh, <laughs> since then, uh, there wasn't really any replies from, from Jeff Bezos or anything like that, but it still was a little bit uh, um, kind of hilarious to, to, to see uh, the, the kind of reaction and response from Elon Musk. And that being said, they have a, a, a couple of things coming up that we're going to talk about a little bit later. But this was a very successful launch of the new Shepard vehicle. And by the way, that was powered by the BE-3 engine. And interestingly, that engine might be used for an upper stage engine on United Launch Alliance's Vulcan rocket in the future. So uh, very successful launch for Blue Origin and congratulations to that whole team. And you know, that was a uh, very cool launch and definitely very surprising. At least this time they did give us a couple of days heads up before it happened. So, very cool. I absolutely <laughs> love the engineers cheering on because uh, the, what they're doing, regardless of who, who cares who did it first, right. what they're doing is hard 
it, it, it doesn't, it's just straight up, it's very hard to do. And they successfully did it, and they are working on helping to drive the cost of space flight down. So a huge congratulations to the entire team of Blue Origin. Uh, that was, I, I love yeah. that moment. That moment, the, the, just the, all of them cheering and seeing all of their years and years of hard work paying off. That was that was so cool. Yeah. That was so cool. As an engineer, that's like the moment that I live for is seeing everybody, you know, everything paying off and coming together and the success happening. It's Absolutely. It's so great to see it. I, I'm really excited to see where they go with uh, the entire vehicle. So, all right, let's do some uh, launch coverage really quickly. Uh, we were off for uh, a week, so uh, we're going back a little bit. The, first up, we have an H2A with the Telstar 12 Vantage satellite. They give it a moment. So this was shot a little ways away, so you got to give it a moment for the sound to catch up to the light. It'll be here in a second. There it is. I always love that. Uh, this launched on November 24th. <laughs> I probably should have talked over when it was silent instead yeah, maybe. of when it's it was okay. instead of when the engine. Silent, silent, silent. <laughs> There's the noise. I'm going to keep talking now. Exactly. November yes. 24th at 6:50 Coordinated Universal Time. Uh, this this vehicle passed the speed of sound in less than a minute. It's the H2A rocket from uh, from Japan. Uh, this was the first time the H2A fired its upper stage engines three times before deploying the satellite. They had to modify the H2A upper stage for this flight, which involved painting the upper stage a different color, so that it would, specifically white, so that it wouldn't overheat. Um, they had to add additional thermal insulation and add lithium ion batteries to power the upper stage of the rocket through those three different burns. The payload was a Telstar 12 Vantage, which is gonna replace the Telstar 12 satellite, which was launched in 1999. And it's going to be a communication satellite uh, for basically uh, out at sea kind of vessels over the Caribbean, South Atlantic, Mediterranean, and North Sea. So seafaring vehicles that need like internet and communication access, that's what this is, uh, that's what that's going out to. Very uh, important. Uh, very, very important stuff, right? Uh, especially, especially if you're taking a cruise and you want your internet <laughs> <laughs> to work. First world Satellites problems. Like there first you go. world problems. Satellite like this help. But even outside of that, like emergency <laughs> responders for yes. off offshore oil rigs, um, yes. any sort of, uh, you know, ships out at sea, you need to have communication in a, in a modern civilization. Absolutely. That's what those do. How about a Long March 4C? So this was a... Uh, Chinese military spy satellite launched November 27th at 2124, coordinating universal time. Uh, it's a polar orbit that they sent this satellite to. Uh, because it's a military satellite, they didn't really offer too much in the way of details as to what it is or what's going on. Uh, so it's thought to be a radar reconnaissance satellite, and it fits the same kind of um, orbital pattern as the other satellites that predated it in 2006, 2007, and 2010. And um, this was the 16th launch for China this year. I was to say, I appreciate that even though they're not giving me a lot of details, they're like, hey, 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 we launched again. Oh, hey, we way. launched again? What, uh, what? We launched again. Seriously, they kind of came out of nowhere <laughs> with the ability to just launch and 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 launch. 16, that's more than one per month. It was a busy summer of working in the factory with <laughs> rockets, I guess. I guess. So. And finally, I mean, uh, that's actually the low number for China in the past. They've had up to like, I think that in, I think their record is like in 2008, they had 52 launches in one year. Of course, yeah. multiple different vehicles, but still. Whoa. 52? They're crazy. Hey, they That's are like a big country, a okay? It's like one a week. Big yeah, country. They've got a lot of stuff to loft. They can Boom. launch like from yeah. multiple, multiple places. That's just incredible <laughs> cadence. You know, I normally, I actually got sick of doing this. I normally grab the debris shots because they yeah. also shoot like, because they they launch way inland <laughs> as opposed to like out by the sea, ocean. So, yeah. uh, you know, the first stage just falls like, that on land <laughs> and crushes things in its path and i normally sometimes post the debris people's houses. <laughs> whatever sometimes whatever i normally grab that but it's just happened so much i'm just like yeah no no debris debris <laughs> picture all the things you've seen before it's just like we that. should just have the exact same picture every time it's a new fountain <laughs> that's, for your that's house. terrible that's terrible <laughs> sorry i'm sorry <laughs> all right and finally uh vega launched with lisa pathfinder Two. Uh. Boom. That is a Ooh. Vega launcher, which I believe is a solid first stage, which is yes. why uh, that uh, that just took off right up, just right off the pad. It's like, goodbye, Earth, I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> 
How's it like? <laughs> it's like, goodbye, Earth. I'm gone. <laughs> I'm out of here as fast as possible. <laughs> goodbye, everybody. I'll see you later. Interesting <laughs> accent that the rocket has. That happened Thursday, December 3rd at 4.04. It's French, man. It's what do you want? 4.04, quite a universal time. Like I said, that was carrying the Lisa Pathfinder. It's an experimental spacecraft that took about 10 years to build. And as the name implies, it's, uh, it's going to be kind of a pathfinding mission for future satellites and future technology. Mm -hmm. Its job is to test stuff that's been, actually was invented and refined for this mission. <laughs> 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 it's got to test things. <laughs> It can do experiments. It's real cool. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I hate you all. Control. I hate you all. Uh, <laughs> what kind of test is it going to do, man? Well, it has new inertial sensors that are going to be tested for the first time in space. <laughs> Thanks for that. For the uh, high precision laser uh, things and free floating mirrors. It's going to test stuff. Actually, oh, what, what's this? That's for? exactly what your notes say. Test stuff. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what I actually said? No. Oh. I wish you did, though. Lisa, it's the la laser inf interferometry. Interferometry. <laughs> interferometer. Okay, what is that? What's an interferometry? If you could say the word that misspeaks, you know what it Space is. Space antenna. Okay. Okay. So interferometry, that's yes. when you use multiple mirrors in order to combine as like a single mirror. But in this case, it's using multiple lasers to try to detect gravitational waves. Oh, all right. So instead of doing it on Earth where you have to account for the Earth's gravitational field sure. and like a bus passing 20 miles away and other fun things, right. um, they're putting it out in space so that it literally is in the most stable type of environment you can put a gravitational wave detector. But this isn't, so while this is designed to help us detect gravitational waves, mm -hmm. this itself is not the gravitational wave detector. This is proving the technologies for us to build the bigger gravitational wave detector. Yes, because the bigger gravitational wave detector will actually be multiple spacecraft flying in formation. But they want to make sure first that the actual systems will work in space because nobody has ever flown these systems in the space before. And if I were to sum that up in two words, I'd say probably Probably to test stuff. Yes. That's how to I would, test stuff. I would we sum that particular the thing one. To test the thing so we can build the other thing? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> All right. Pretty much what it I is. I just want to make sure I understood. All right, Jared, uh, take us away uh, with whatever your thing is. Very <laughs> awesome story actually coming out, which is that Akatsuki, a Jack. Whoa! A Boom! That's right. what I do. You're the I only pronounce. person who can pronounce things on I this show. I pronounce things correctly on this show. Yes. Um, just wait till later when we when we throw out something. But Akatsuki, which is a mission that Japan launched in 2010, is going to be arriving. I'm sorry, what year? 2000. Oh, 2010. Excuse me. Thank you. Sorry, Ben. Uh, yes, it'll be arriving at Venus on December 7th, so mm -hmm. upcoming up yes. this Monday. Um, it was originally going to go into orbit around Venus in 2010, um, but unfortunately it had a problem during its orbital insertion burn with its engine, where it ended up accidentally putting too much oxidizer in there and damaged the engine, and oh. it cut out. So it was only about a third of the way through its burn, so it ended up flying straight past Venus. Let's take a look at it real quick here. Here's uh, a great <laughs> image. <laughs> Thanks, JAXA. <laughs> Thanks for getting it out. Um, now, Very high quality. it continued in orbit around the sun. It actually ended up going much closer to the sun than was expected, and it took on uh, thermal loads about 30 to 40 degrees Celsius uh, higher than was expected. That is not a small amount. No, Ew. that is not, especially for a scientific probe that's only supposed to last for two years in the uh, environment around Venus. Um, now, they ended up figuring out that they could use the engine a little bit, not to the uh, degree that, they, or not to the amount that they were able to, uh, only about 10% of the ori original efficiency. Um, so they're going to attempt to, to try to get it back in orbit around Venus and keep that mission going, but they're going to be using the reaction control system to actually burn uh, this time to try to get it in orbit around Venus. So they're, they're using the RCS thrusters, yes. the reaction control system, mm -hmm. as their, like, their main mm -hmm. method of propulsion. Yeah. The, Clever. The propulsion Twice. system on board can't run at the efficiency that they need to put it into orbit, and they also don't want to risk even further damaging it, and then, sure. you know, now you're not going to be able to go into orbit, and you're just going to stay in orbit around the sun. Yes, so. Mike. Jared, do you know if they had vented the uh, fuel for the main engine or if that is still on board? From what I understand, the fuel was vented from the tanks in order to lower uh, the weight of Akatsuki in order to make sure that it would be as lightweight as possible um, so that way the RC, the reaction control system thrusters would have the maximum amount of push uh, against it. So hmm. Makes sense. Stuff. Yeah. Thank Good you. luck to them. Uh, really looking yeah. forward to hearing that. So. Yeah. All right. Moving along. Uh, Carrie Ann.
So uh, I this came up the other day, uh, just a vertical assembly. I'm sorry, the vehicle assembly building came up at work the other well, it's day. It's a vertical. I mean, it is vertical. Well, it originally was called a vertical assembly building. Yes. So I felt like I was pretty safe in saying that, but then it, it sort of it bothered me later on. <laughs> and so uh, after looking into the vehicle assembly building, it uh, turns out they're having some work done. They're getting a little bit of a facelift uh, internally. Nose? Is it the nose? Nose lift? I'm not really sure. Anyway, the fire suppression <laughs> systems are getting an upgrade is really what I'm trying to say. Um, in preparation for the space launch system coming in, uh, what they needed to do is uh, make sure that, of course, everyone stays safe and the vehicle stays safe, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the building was originally constructed around 1965, completed in 1966. So... She's been around for a wee bit. Mm -hmm. And to give you an idea, it's always so difficult to uh, to describe just how large this is. It is, quote, the largest one-story building, <laughs> right? It even has weather <laughs> on the inside of the building, which is absolutely insane. Um, so there are four high, bay, high bays yep. comprising and with an internal height of 456 feet or not quite 139 meters or another way of looking at it, a little over 45 stories tall. Oh my gosh, I didn't realize it was that big. Yes. Jeez. Right? right? It's taller than Florida, I it's, believe. It's pretty much, <laughs> than all of Florida, yes, pretty much. <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> you made me snort. <laughs> It sounds like an evil plan. To, right? You know, we're going to build a building as tall as a state. <laughs> <laughs> right. The, the, the square footage is 137,175 square feet or 41,810 square meters. It's large. It's very... It's big. Very... It's big. One unit of huge. Large, yes. Um, there's room enough to assemble multiple vehicles, in case you were wondering, uh, with commercial crew as well. So interested parties, in case anyone out there is building the... Wants to build a 45-story rocket. I suppose it has to be like a 44-story rocket. Right, well, you have to have the you crane have and the, all yeah. the... Mm -hmm. get well, the door may be even smaller than that, too. So. Yeah, it is a little bit smaller yeah. than that. I apologize, I don't have the stats on, on exactly how big that is. We need to know uh, how so big of a rocket we're going to build It may be tomorrow. the world's biggest door, for all for we the, know. So. Uh, what is it, the, <laughs> the space... Uh, space uh, program of tomorrow, spot. Spot the space program of tomorrow. Spot. <laughs> so yeah. interested parties in spot uh, need to need to make sure that they register their interest in using the vehicle assembly building by mid 2016. So everybody get on that. Yeah. Uh, so they're doing the upgrades to the fire suppression system, new fire pumps, controllers, fire protection uh, piping, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They're doing a refurbishment of a 1.4 million gallon water storage tank, which I thought was. Crazy pants, and I apologize. I don't know how many Olympic-sized swimming pools that would actually. How many be. football fields is it? <laughs> how many cricket half. pitches? <laughs> how many <laughs> elephants? All right. Anyway, the, the the company that's doing all the work is based in Merritt Island. Uh, they've been in uh, they've been in work since 1975. They've done work on the the vehicle launch. Uh, vehicle launch, vehicle assembly building or VAB, launch control center, utility annex, launch complex 39B, launch equipment test facility, operations and checkout building. They are family owned and they also, among other things, help Atlantis get into her new home. Oh, on display. oh how good oh, nice. them. I know, isn't that cute? Yeah, nice so crazy. I, I thought that was adorable. So <laughs> okay, you all suck. Anyway, so <laughs> <laughs> Mike has got some SpaceX news. Mike, please save us. <laughs> well, speaking of upgrades, uh, S S SpaceX is hoping to launch their next uh, Falcon 9 rocket in mid-December. Uh, the CEO of Orgcom is saying that the earliest possible date might be December 15th, so hopefully all goes well with that. And with this rocket, there's a lot of different upgrades on this. Not just is this the return to flight of the Falcon 9, but they are increasing the amount of thrust that the Merlin 1D engines that power the first stage are able to produce. They have increased them from 140. 7,000 pounds of thrust at sea level to 170,000 pounds of thrust. So that's a huge increase. And with that, and they've, they've made upgrades in the past where the fuel tanks for the first stage are longer. So with this, they're going to be able to have a lot more fuel left over, especially with this additional thrust, to be able to attempt to make landings with that first stage. But also, they've upgraded the upper stage engine as well. And it has a longer nozzle, and the fuel tanks of the upper stage are 
longer as well. That will be able to give SpaceX the capability of launching satellites, heavier satellites, into geostationary orbit and to possibly have uh, longer burns and longer periods that they would be able to operate at the upper stage as well. Plus, with all that extra fuel, again, that will give even more extra fuel to be able to attempt a landing of the first stage. And some interesting uh, reports have been coming out. Uh, one of the a, a NASA spokesperson has said that SpaceX might be attempting to land the Falcon 9 first stage on land at one of the complexes that they have have refurbished at uh, excuse me at Cape Canaveral to be able to actually land on. There's uh, one of five sites that they are currently doing work on to have uh, not just the the return stages for the Falcon 9 core stage, but three stages for the Falcon Heavy, uh, a spot for the Dragon capsule to come down on propulsive landing, and hopefully in the future, the upper stage as well. So there isn't necessarily... Uh, we have a picture of, of the Falcon 9 first stage arriving to Cape Canaveral, and it doesn't look like from this picture, even though it's a nighttime photo, that there are any landing legs attached to this. That doesn't mean that they might attach landing legs uh, in, in their, uh, essentially their vehicle assembly building, and there is a chance that they could do a landing, but probably not with this mission. If, if, if I was uh, in, in control, I probably wouldn't want to do a landing attempt on this mission to add even more complexity to this return to flight since it is so vital that they get things going again. So uh, very interesting there. The uh, upper stage will be arriving to up Cape Canaveral within the week and uh, once the payloads have, uh, all of the payloads have, have been arriving and I think that all 11 of the Orbcom OG2 or second generation or Orbcom satellites have arrived at Cape Canaveral and they'll be uh, doing all the work of putting all the pieces together and hopefully launching that off before this year ends. So. Very cool. All right, Jared. Yeah, we're moving on, we're going to talk about Rosetta, the extremely successful ESA, or European Space Agency mission, uh, which went to uh, Comet 67P, or as you would pronounce it, its actual name. Oh my god, you're going to actually pronounce this. Churudyamov Gerasimenko. Nice. Boom. Bam. That's how it works. Nice. All right, so it's already spent over a year studying that, and it dropped Philae back in uh, November of 2014, which uh, successfully bounced and rolled um, <laughs> across the as, surface. As planned. Which, as planned. By the way, even though it did that, we got all the data back that we wanted from it and extra. So it did oh, wow. its job, even awesome. though it, it sort of whoopsied. Um, funding has been approved, and there's enough. <laughs> whoopsie. Fuel. It did. It whoopsie. But they got a great cartoon out of that. Yeah, they did. Yeah. They did. And actually, I was just watching a video today of seeing Philae, uh, the actual data of it tumbling across the surface <laughs> and I'm trying not to laugh because I know someone out there spent their whole life working on it only to see it like spinning <laughs> across. Oh, so, that's got to hurt. Um, so it's got enough fuel to continue studying uh, the comet for the next 10 months and actually it's going to do some very interesting things because the comet is now moving away from the sun so it's starting to become less active. So it approached the comet when it was still on approach to the sun um, and then it reached perihelion, the closest point to the sun on August 13th of this year and it's now going to watch it for a year coming back. So a year in and a year out, basically, is how it's working. Um, so we're going to see a comet at two points during its orbit around the sun, and that will tell us different things about it. So one uh, interesting thing it'll do, it'll fly out 2,000 kilometers and then slowly go through the tail of the comet to see what that environment is like and take some good science from there. But the thing we're all really looking forward to is that in September 2016, they have been approved to attempt to land Rosetta on the surface of the comet. Let's take a look at Rosetta here, um, as we were. Uh, with <laughs> it's a live shot. As we got it. Live shot of Rosetta. Live shot of Rosetta. Um, Space can, is very gray. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's around the comet, so what do you <laughs> oh, expect? That's right. <laughs> uh, now, it's going to try to land on the surface, but its high-gain antenna has to be oriented at the Earth to communicate. And those solar panels are extremely fragile, and they are big. It's about 32 meters from tip to tip Whoa. on those solar panels. They are very, very big. So um, very, very tough to try uh, to land this on a comet, but they're very, they're, they have some confidence that they can actually get it to touch down gently and maybe take uh, data from the surface. And but this can... is a plus. This isn't part of the original mission, yes, right? This, this, is, is... this is like, all right, now what? <laughs> this is the extent extended mission. We've already, they've already done the science, they've gotten all of the data that they went there to get for their primary science mission, and now everything from here on out is bonus. So more bang for your buck than you were expecting. It's bonus like science. the best Kickstarter project ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> these are stretch goals, weren't they? Stretch goals, yes. Yeah, these are Rosetta stretch goals. Stretch goals. So, all right, cool. Yeah. 
Anything else? Uh, I was going to say, this is really interesting to me because this spacecraft deployed the first vehicle to land on a comet, and it will now attempt to become the second vehicle to land on a comet. Ah, so, that is interesting. Very cool stuff. All right, Carrie Ann? Yeah? Take us into break. Yay! Okay, so I just got so excited about this one. This is what we like to call a different kind of space race. So uh, European Space Agency astronaut Tim Peake is going to actually run the London Marathon aboard the International Space Station. Awesome. Right? Which means he wins because he pretty much will do it in like six seconds. Very nice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think it's even a second, right? I mean, I think, yeah, it's going to be the fastest. Well, I mean, it's, it's how many miles? About five seconds. Yeah, all right, give or take. Five and a, five and a fifth. Well, he's like got to breathe. Yeah. It's about know, five, what is it, uh, seven, eight kilometers per second? Roughly. I'm guessing he's so. going to pace himself, though, yeah. if I may. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's been prepping for years. <laughs> he actually did run the London Marathon uh, back in 1999 in about three hours, 18 minutes, and 50 Whoa. seconds. And, uh, and But he doesn't think that this one is going to be a personal record. He's aiming to do it in three hours and 30 minutes. <laughs> or amazing. to somewhere between that and four hours. Uh, so aboard the International Space Station, of course, harnessed down to the treadmill, but he'll get the views of what he would normally have seen on the marathon route via a digital video. So cool. he'll be able to kind of know exactly what he's going past. Yes? According to Wicked, Tim yes. will be the first man to run a marathon in space, but the second person to do so. Yes. I believe Sunita Williams was the first uh, to run a marathon on the International Space Station, mm. and it was the Boston Marathon, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. so. Which is really difficult to qualify into, so that was super amazing. Yes. I feel like if you go high, I'm going to be in space, and I would like to, and then enter, blank anything? line here. Anything? The answer is almost always yes, you qualify. Uh, we'll have to look into that. Yeah. <laughs> Slash, I'm going to have to start writing a lot of letters. <laughs> Tim Peake is quoted as saying the London Marathon is a worldwide event, so why don't we just take it out of this world? He's scheduled to launch on the Soyuz TMA-19M, which is scheduled for December 15th. He will be the first Brit aboard the space station, spending six months in orbit. Uh, he's actually doing this to help out the what's called the Prince's Trust. It's a charity that works with youth education and training. Uh, the actual marathon itself will be uh, April 24th, 2016. Like I said, you'll get a digital video of the course, so that's kind of cool. And uh, he thinks that the worst part is not going to be running the marathon itself per se, even on a treadmill, but it's being harnessed in. Mm. He said it gets yeah. kind of uncomfortable after about 40 minutes to an hour. So considering he's trying to do this in about like three and a half hours to four hours, that could be really, talk about chafing. Like anyone who runs, yeah, gonna be tough. <laughs> that's going to be really, really difficult. But that, that's kind of exciting. It'd be cool if they gave him like VR goggles and, so, right, and so simulate kind of it. Yeah, so he could yeah. look around yeah. like as if like, he were there. Like this is amazing. And how yeah. cool would it be if there was a robot actually running like the course for him <laughs> on the ground that was like you know, taking the measurements of how many steps that he that he has ran and keeping up with him. How we have an extra Robonaut, don't we? It so people can look and see him. Can we just keep Robonaut with the wheels and have it run the course at about the same pace that he's doing? That and then he can get live VR? Oh my god, that would be epic. Can just, we just Robonaut just <laughs> to Kickstarter? Right? Yes! Starter. Obviously, because we can stretch goal anything now. <laughs> oh my God. I'm sure that Tim Peake will be down. This is this sounds like a great idea. See, well, this, this is, is a the show. This space program of tomorrow is really to be. Oh, my God. Will, Will is regretting being here already. Absolutely. Oh, he's tell. already left. You didn't know? <laughs> Speaking of, yeah. <laughs> we, we quietly heard the door behind us. Yes. Speaking of Will, uh, we have got Will Pomerantz of Virgin Galactic who will be joining us next. And Jared, you will be doing an interview with Seth. He didn't know that until just right now. Surprise. Uh, Good well, luck. With Mr. Pomerantz. So we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, let's get our launcher one on. Yes. And welcome back to tomorrow. Let's go ahead and take a look at our patrons that we have here. Thank you, guys. These are the patrons who have donated $5 or more to our show. And, of course, you can find us at patreon.com slash 
T-M-R-O if you would like to end up joining these people. And joining me here today, we have the Vice President of Special Projects at Virgin Galactic, William Pomerantz. Hello. Thanks for coming on the show today. Absolutely my pleasure. Always happy to be on. You, you I think you hold the record for the most times a guest I, has been I, on our I show I certainly here. did at one point. I thought that Dave Mastin or, or others may have surpassed me, but I, I'd like to think I'm still in the top five at least. Excellent. Well, I'm just going to go ahead and introduce you with our laundry list of things that we have here. You are obviously the Vice President of Special Projects at Virgin Galactic, the author and manager of the Google Lunar X Prize from 2005 to 2011, a Harvard and International Space University graduate on the Board of Advisors for Students for the Exploration and Development of Space. You've done a TED Talk. And I guess my first question for you today is what haven't you done? Uh, well, um, the thing you missed that I would love to talk about most is that I've got a baby. I've got a three-month-old yes. baby oh, congratulations. who's just on the other side of this wall. So if you hear some wailing, yeah. um, you'll know it's not necessarily the crew in the back room. It's <laughs> yes. a, uh, it could be a baby, or it could be the crew. I don't know. Could we'll, be. We'll, we'll wait and see. But yeah, congratulations to you and your wife well, on that. Thank you very much. And I, I hope you it. enjoy being a parent. It's, it's been wonderful. You know, my reaction in the delivery room was actually very similar to the Blue Origin staff reaction in the video you showed at the top of the show. That is just beautiful. It's pre pretty good day. That is wonderful. <laughs> were, you re were you reacting in the yes. everything? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously we want to talk about the big news that happened this week, yeah. which is Launcher 1 and some changes that are happening yep. to it. So um, first and foremost, Launcher 1 is now going to be deployed via 747-400. That is exactly right. Yeah, we, uh, we had this wonderful problem we were discovering early in the year where uh, actually the business that we were doing on both sides of our program was high enough that we were running into sort of a competition between Spaceship Two and Launcher One for the same carrier aircraft. It mm -hmm. used to be when we first started, they both planned on using the White Knight Two, and, and they were just sort of bumping into each other in the lobby, as it were, and saying, no, the aircraft's mine today, no, the aircraft's mine today. <laughs> um, so once we realized that the best way to solve that was by getting a dedicated carrier aircraft, we said, hey, look, this is a good opportunity to figure out, should we just accelerate the build of the next White Knight Two, or should we go out and find something else? Let's take a look again at our customers, let's look at the market and discovered that the market had, uh, had gotten, uh, the satellites had gotten a little bigger. A lot of the companies mm -hmm. who started with very small sats had, had decided they wanted to add some capability because they were making the revenue to justify doing so, to making a little bit more investment into their satellites. So uh, they were all saying, I want to go a little higher, I want to carry a little bit bigger satellite. And to do that, we realized we needed a bigger carrier aircraft. So went and did a big global search for uh, every type of plane out there you can imagine, and uh, yeah, though at the end of the day, the one that won, the one that won that sort of internal competition was was a seven four seven. Yeah, and it just so happens that seven four seven is also a Virgin Atlantic. Uh, vehicle, uh, and, aircraft and not well. only that, it came to us with the name Cosmic Girl. Perfect. Which kind of makes it seem like <laughs> destiny. Uh, I can promise you that wasn't the uh, deciding factor, but it certainly was a nice bonus once we had, uh, <laughs> once we sort of worked out all the math and the spreadsheets and decided that was the way for us to go. That's awesome. Now, Launcher One was originally supposed to be 100 to 300 kilograms to orbit, and you're now looking at what I believe it's somewhere 300 to 450. It, um, exactly, yeah. and uh, and I find it's always difficult when you're comparing launch vehicles because everyone lists it in a different orbit just to be as uh, inconvenient as possible. Absolutely. So for us, when we're talking about that sort of 300 kilogram range, we are talking about that to uh, not to some like marketing orbit that's just a will give you the highest number possible. Although I could give you that number, but uh, but it's really 300 kilometers to the orbit that's of interest to the largest group of our customers. So mm -hmm. that's like a high inclination, a, a polar or even a sun synchronous orbit, and going up to an altitude of you know 500 kilometers or more. We can get a, I think a pretty pretty good amount of mass up to there. Um, and again, we're sort of chasing both where the market is today and where we think it might be going over the next couple of years as we finalize development of the program and get it into service. Yeah, and one of the things I really like about uh, the, the news about that from this week is that you were able to do that and still keep the price the same as well for your customers. Yeah, exactly. That was uh, That's a, a nice benefit both of the carrier aircraft, which, you know, 747, an awesome airplane. I, I will admit I'm not a big plane guy. I haven't grown up as an aviation geek nearly as much as a space geek, but uh, I've been getting an education very quickly from, from my colleagues who are plane guys and plane gals. Uh, 747 is a great, you know, great, great piece of equipment. They've been flying all over the world for a long time. There's a great worldwide base of, of parts and maintenance crews and, and hangars and runways that can handle the aircraft, but also just really overpowered for what we need. We could carry an even heavier rocket than we planned to carry. And because we had invested from the start in sort of modular rocket technologies because we knew we were on a growth path. You know, this is a Launcher 1, but someday there'll be a Launcher 2 and a Launcher 3. Uh, so we didn't have to make very many changes to the rocket system in order to accommodate a, a larger payload. Effectively, what we did was just stretch the tanks using the same tank technology that we were planning 
on developing, or that we had already been developing anyway. Uh, so that allowed us to, yeah, to, to basically double our payload to the same orbit, a little, little bit more than double our payload without having to increase our own costs that much, which meant we didn't really have to increase the price that much. Awesome. Now, uh, where where exactly is Launcher 1 going to be based out of now with the 747? <laughs> so uh, the 747 itself is in Texas, and it'll probably stay in Texas for about a year or so. Um, right now, she's undergoing one of the routine, you know, scheduled heavy, heavy maintenance checks that any uh, airliner goes through. So it's a it's called the D check. It's mm -hmm. it's something that will happen, you know, something on the order of about once a decade. It's a little more frequently than that if it's in routine passenger surface. It'll probably be a little less frequently than that for us because. Although we hope to fly very often, we probably won't be flying quite as often as, say, Virgin Atlantic uh, was, was flying the aircraft before we got her. Uh, so the airplane will stay, stay there to do that heavy maintenance check and then to do the modifications that we have to do to make it so that we can mount Launcher 1 uh, under the wing. We're launching under the left wing. Actually, it's essentially in the identical position that's been used by 747s a lot over the years to carry a spare engine. You know, whenever an airline buys an extra engine and they just need to ferry it from wherever they bought it to wherever they store it, there's already a mount. If you walk, ever get a chance to walk <laughs> under the wing of a 747 will be written right, right there. It's a spare engine mount. Um, so we don't have to do that much work, but we do have to do a little work to make sure we don't have, you know, the flaps impinging on the rocket or anything else like that. So those modifications will all happen in Texas. Meanwhile, all the rocket part of Launcher One, all, all that effort happens at this relatively new facility we opened up in March of this year in Long Beach, California. We've got a 150,000 square foot manufacturing floor there, um, and that is home to somewhere on the order of 150 of our employees who are really focused on getting that program technically ready and operationally ready. So whether that is uh, designing and building the Newton rocket engines that we've been firing for a while now, or, or our composite tanks, or some of the advanced manufacturing techniques that we have, it, that, all, that all lives in Long Beach. Mm -hmm. Operationally, the flights, our initial flights will happen uh, based out of Mojave. We'll sort of take out from Mojave and fly west and go out over the water a, a safe distance and, and launch from there. And that's a great place from which to access polar orbits or other high inclination orbits. Um, but the nice part about being an air launch system is we can fly from an awful lot of places. It's, it's not just everywhere. And obviously, you have, you have to do a little bit of coordination of, in advance with the FAA. Um, but there are a lot of places we can fly from. So, uh, so as you can imagine, we've been looking at a lot of the likely suspects on the East Coast for places where we might fly from to reach lower inclinations, um, but have our sights on some other, other sites around the world uh, as regulatorily appropriate, at least, uh, for us to be able to, to access anywhere our customers could ever want to go. Now, what's the market for Launcher One look like? Like, what are you, what are you guys seeing as the primary users of Launcher One? Uh, it's a good market, and what I really like about it the most is that it's a diverse market. You know, uh, a lot of people ask this very good question of. We saw a satellite boom, you know, 20 years ago in the era of, of Iridium and Teledisic, and, uh, and that obviously didn't pan out very well yeah. <laughs> um, for anybody, whether on the launch side or, or on, the, uh, on the satellite side. And, and so people ask, and I asked, and, you know, our investors asked from day one, is this going to be any different? And obviously nobody knows the future, but I think there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic about it being different. Um, some is just the tech pace of technology has changed, both terrestrially and, and in the skies and space. Um, but also, you know, if you look at, at that first boom, uh, those constellations were all tackling, you know, versions of the same market. It wasn't exactly the same market, but versions of the same market, which meant they were all sort of susceptible to the same problems. You could have one terrestrial competitor come in or one or two terrestrial competitors come in and just totally axe that market and everything was depending on those one of those two companies succeeding. Mm -hmm. um, now I see some similar markets. You know, one of our anchor customers, obviously, this company called OneWeb, who's already purchased the launch for 39 satellites uh, from us with options for 100 more. Uh, there are others kind of in that telecommunications space, but we also see Earth observation and remote sensing. We see ship and other asset tracking. We see asteroid mining. We see, you know, all kinds of different models. Uh, who's to say if any one of them individually will succeed? But we sort of have spread that risk across a pretty broad broad portfolio, and I think there's reason to believe that many of them, if not all of them, certainly will be successful. Yeah, now we have a, a question from our chat room from Tewicked, which is, is it possible to have one rocket on each wing of that 747? <laughs> can you can you have two rockets and maybe launch one in one direction and launch the other it in It sure another? would look cool, wouldn't it? It would. Um, <laughs> uh, certainly Sir Richard would love it if we did that, and I think he, I think someone sketched it out once, and we got a cool drawing in our office of what that would look like. Uh, we're not going to be doing that anytime soon, but who knows what the future holds. You know, I, I could see maybe for some of the 
not necessarily for the civil or commercial applications, but there may be other parts of the space sector that might be interested in things like that. Um, that's not what we're doing now. I don't want to imply that we're secretly doing that in a hangar somewhere, but dang it if it wouldn't look cool. Yeah. Uh, so maybe pretty, someday. Yeah, like some action movie Yeah, awesome exactly. This, so. exactly. Um, and you talked about the, the modular ability of mm -hmm. your rocket, especially mm -hmm. when you were talking about the idea of going on to like a launcher two and a launcher three. Yep. What, what would those look like? Are we talking like a bigger rocket? With yeah. A better pay uh, I'll be honest, we don't know exactly. Okay. We have some ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly, you know, we've got a, a long-term vision that comes from our founder, from, from, from Richard Branson. Um, you know, I, I think it's awesome we live in a time where we've got multiple space billionaires that all have their own vision for what to do with space. And I think all of those <laughs> visions are great. You know, if you've got, you've got one company that's talking about putting humans on Mars, and that's fantastic, and others that seem to have their sights set on the moon, and that's fantastic. Um, Richard is really more Earth-focused. Uh, so a lot of the future applications, not to say he's not interested in the moon or Mars, because who wouldn't be? Uh, obviously he is. But, but really the things he cares about most are how do we use space to best improve the lives of people here on Earth? Whether that's getting more data from these satellites that we can use or, or providing internet connectivity from these satellites, or it's things like allowing people to, tra to transfer themselves around, around the globe more quickly, and things like point-to-point. -point. Now, point-to-point -point is super hard. Yes. Uh, doing point to point, at least in any sort of economically viable way, is incredibly difficult. You know, I would say it's probably harder um, <laughs> even than, than going orbital in many yeah. ways in terms of its concept of operations and its economics. Um, so that's not Spaceship Two, but it is something we would like to, or not Spaceship Three, even. It's something mm -hmm. we would like to get to someday. Mm -hmm. And you can sort of, even though we don't have the blueprints for that vehicle, you can start to chart out, okay, here are the technology areas in which we need to improve. You know, we're not smart enough today to do that. I don't think anyone's smart enough today to do that. What are the what are the books we need to study? What are the subjects we really need to brush up on in order to get there? Uh, and what I get really excited about is I think if you, if you just write that list of fields in which one needs to get smart to do that, um, with Spaceship Two, we were already studying a lot of those subjects, but not all of them. Yes. Uh, and I think now with Launcher One, we're filling in those blanks. Not enough to jump straight to point to point, but yeah. <laughs> uh, but we're getting smarter. We're, we are crawling before we walk, before we, before we run. Okay. Uh, so what I think you will see at some point in the future, whether it's at the Spaceship Three level or Spaceship Four or Spaceship Ten, is sort of a marrying of these two different technology lines for us, where we take the uh, the fully reusable, the human rated, the uh, quick turnaround times that you see on Spaceship Two, and you combine that with the advanced manufacturing and the low cost and the and the sort of uh, the more scalable propulsion technologies and the, even the regulatory regimes, regimes that you've seen from Launcher One, you put the two of those together and, uh, and hopefully that allows us to accomplish even cooler things than we're already working on. Mm -hmm. Now another question from our chat room from Mark is that could you make a reusable single stage uh, to launch on a rocket, like from your airplane? Is that, is that like something that may be on the far horizon? Or? Um, so uh, we certainly have given some thought to at some point in the future making the first rocket stage of the Launcher 1 system uh, fully reusable. Again, it's not what, something we're working on right now. Uh, we think we've already got a compelling price point for our customers with mm -hmm. an expendable system. Uh, and we also know they're in a hurry. They, they want to launch now. You know, Some of them have satellites already sitting on the shelf. The rest of them have plans to develop a lot over the next year or 18 months, and they, they want to be in orbit as quickly as possible. And if we jump straight to full reusability on that first rocket stage, that would take us a little while longer. Uh, so we've thought about it. Um, I think actually Air Launch maybe offers some unique advantages in terms of how you might re recover that stage. Um, so we're not doing it right now because, um, like I said, we want to we want to walk before we crawl, before we run. Um, but it's something we're thinking about already, definitely. And what's the response from the scientific community been with Launcher One? Because we talk about commercial applications, yeah. but also scientific applications yeah. too are very yeah, important. Yeah, there certainly has, has been one. Um, uh, we were very proud that uh, a month or so ago, we uh, NASA announced that they had purchased a launch from us. Uh, they're actually flying on one of our test flights. Uh, so one of the earliest flights, not the first, but one of the earlier flights uh, to go to orbit of Launcher One. Uh, and they are filling up that, um, that ride with more than a dozen. They actually haven't told us exactly how many yet, but they've said it's more than a dozen uh, experimental satellites, some of which are engineering focused, but actually most of which it looks like will probably be science focused. 
Uh, and a lot of those are cubes or other smaller satellites that have literally been collecting dust on shelves uh, for a long time, just waiting for a ride. You know, they've been at the side of the road with their thumb out trying to hitchhike <laughs> a ride to orbit for a long time, and, mm -hmm. and those, that wasn't coming. And that's why NASA was, was interested in both sort of fostering the capacity that we and other companies are developing and, and getting a ride for those people. So obviously there's a huge amount of excitement among those principal investigators and those researchers, those students who are flying those things. Uh, and I think that's also been a nice sign to the rest of the science community. Um, I think people also are also pretty excited that, um, that the price point is so much lower um, than a lot of the other uh, rockets that are available on the market right now. Mm -hmm. Even though it's equal or, or higher even in uh, terms of a dollars per kilogram or dollars per pound, just the absolute price is so much lower that whenever NASA want, issues one of its per periodic calls for sort of smaller satellites, whether the scout missions or, or, you know, pick your acronym or your name that's used depending on which <laughs> mission directorate, um, that maybe there's a chance to come in and say, I can do, I can do a whole lot more with the same amount of money than someone who's buying a, a traditional rocket and spending, you know, if you're only going to give me a total mission cost, including launch of $200 million and everyone else is spending 50 or $60 million on the launch, maybe if I come in and I'm spending 10 or $20 million on the launch, I can put that much more money into my satellite or I can just make twice as many satellites and I can have twice as many launches and I both spread the risk and, and maybe allow interferometry or, or other kinds of cool technologies that you can't do with a single spacecraft regardless of how advanced. So, uh, so it's still early days yet, but I think in general, you know, I, having come from a science background myself, a space science background specifically, everyone's excited about any type of new access, regardless of what the logo on the side of the vehicle is or whether it's ground launch or air launch. If there's something that's getting satellites up there, people are excited to see it as soon as they believe that it's, it's real. It's not just a paper rocket, but there's actually hardware in development. Absolutely, yeah. And talking about development, what's the schedule looking like for Launcher 1? So this past year, we've been making a huge amount of technology progress in terms of real hardware. You know, it, it's gone from uh, from drawings on napkins to uh, to drawings on computer screens to now real hardware that we've been taking out in the field and bending and breaking and firing and doing whatever it is uh, appropriate to that kind of thing. So uh, the one that um, that's easiest to talk about publicly, both because it makes for nice photographs and because it's easy to get those photographs cleared by our expert control officers, uh, is in the propulsion stage. Um, we uh, we made the decision on Launcher One not to outsource the propulsion as as we'd done originally on the Spaceship Two side, but instead to build that in house, largely because because that helps us in the future when we want to build a Launcher 2 or a Spaceship 3 or you know whatever it is. Experience. Uh, exactly. It gives us that experience base. So we uh, we decided we'll start um, with a with a very well characterized fuel choice. We're not going straight to LOX hydrogen or, or something that may be higher uh, higher efficiency but is also less less well known. Uh, we're doing LOX RP1, LOX kerosene. You know, it's a, the kind of engine that you've seen a lot of times before. Obviously, we've got our own ways to make it special, but uh, but we have now built and and fired for long durations. You know, well past steady state. Uh, our larger engine, which is called the Newton Three, which is about a seventy three thousand pound of thrust. Um, uh, rocket engine, and we've got that up on the stand, and the test data from that is, is actually looking really, really great. It's uh, you know, it's not quite the flight version just yet. It wasn't intended to be, but it's a, it's meant to be sort of a workhorse pathfinder that we can test frequently and and get good data from, and go out to the stand and tweak it and, and test it and make it run a little bit better. So we've seen a huge amount of results on that side already. Um, similarly, although less sexy, but uh, but equally important, we've been doing kind of that level of testing on our uh, our composite tanks and our other structures on our avionics, uh, all these other kind of things. So really, if you look at a, at a blown up diagram of the rocket and you draw arrows to every critical subsystem, you know, every single one of them we've done a lot of testing on over the, the course of the past year. Um, and nicely, because of this modularity we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. We don't have to go back and start over just because we changed carrier aircrafts. Um, you know, we've known internally that change in carrier aircraft was coming for quite some time. But even before we knew that was coming, all of the tests that we were doing are directly applicable because it, it is the same engine. You know, we sort of tweaked to one level of its of its throttle range that we were already planning, but it was the range we were already planning. It didn't didn't really require any any massive changes in in the system. Um, so I think the next year will be a, another year of a lot of testing in terms of timelines for first flight. You know, having having learned our lesson. We're trying to not to get too specific about those. It, it will, uh, as with Spaceship 2, it'll fly when, when it's ready to fly, when our customers think it's ready to fly, when uh, our regulators think it's ready to fly. We're sort of forecasting that that will happen sometime in 2017, um, and we'll get more specific on that date as we get a little closer to, uh, to the launch date itself. Um, but it's, it's not 
that far away. There's a, like I said, there's a big building and a lot of hardware already uh, already in existence, uh, giving us faith that we're getting close. Excellent. All right. Well, Will, thank you so much for coming on the show. Absolutely, today. my pleasure. I think Always we're going to have you stick around for After Dark yep. as well, so we can get more questions cool. uh, from our chat. I look forward then. to it. But thank you. Hopefully, you guys have continued success uh, with your systems and keep that development going because it's always awesome to have access. So I appreciate it. Yeah, and Cheers. we're going to we're going to head into the break now, and we'll see you guys with comments after this break. And welcome back to tomorrow. Now, before we get started with some viewer comments from our last show, I did want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are the people who've contributed at least $2.50 to this episode. Not only do they get their name in the show, but they also are going to get access to After Dark as soon as it's posted. Uh, which will have uh, Will, and it'll be, it'll be awesome. It's going to be an epic, epic After Dark, I'm sure. Uh, but wait, there's more. We also have our patron subscribers. That's right, as little as one penny, one penny per episode gets your name in the show. We are a crowdfunded show, and every single penny helps, so you can head on over to patreon.com slash tmro for more information on how you can help support us. All right, let's go ahead and get started with some viewer comments. Now, as you may remember, the last show we did was why Atlantis is your favorite orbiter. <laughs> That's a topic that we kind of shelved for several years and then kind of brought back, dusted that one off, and Atlantis is your favorite. Uh, so uh, let's go ahead and get started with the, uh, the first commenter. Uh, it comes from Miguel Chaffin, 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 off of YouTube. We should ask Jared to pronounce all of these. Yeah. <laughs> Ready, go. Uh, another push for Atlantis. It was actually supposed to be the first orbiter to be decommissioned in 2008 to be used for spare parts for the other two, but it even ended up flying STS-135. You can't decommission the best orbiter of all time. Apparently. I'm just saying it needs to be, it's the, uh, it's the, it caps off the whole program. Caps off the whole program. I guess it just can't be, uh, can't be. Spare parts. Can't, Can't hold spare, a good no. person, yeah. good shuttle no. down. Also, it's in a really cool configuration at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Center Complex. So if you ever have an opportunity to go down there, it is, uh, it's it's kind of like this. It's, uh, <laughs> Can you demonstrate for us? I, I'm demonstrating Atlantis. Excellent. It's like this. Uh, it is, right? It's, it's, just kinda, it's just hanging kind of sideways like as if it were in a space. <laughs> as if it were in space. It's a really cool orientation, really cool layout. So, all right, next up. This one comes from Peter Lund. That one I can pronounce all by myself. <laughs> Off of YouTube as well. My favorite is Baron. Mm. So that is the, uh, I think she's trying to hint that your mic might be off. Yeah, okay. all those things. Mm -hmm. Sorry. He was not getting the subtle hint. No. Nope. Uh, the <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately. <laughs> there you go. Um, uh, that was the Russian answer to the space shuttle. It looked a lot like the space shuttle. It didn't have the solid motors on the side. It actually used liquid. Uh, but it was, it was, in many respects, way more awesome than the U.S. space shuttle. It only flew once, mm -hmm. but that one flight was autonomous. Yes. It went to space and came back and landed completely by computer. No humans required. Unfortunately, that also means no human has ever flown on the Buran. Buran. That's mm -hmm. true. Yeah, is Buran. It, yeah, is Buran. it Buran or Buran? Buran. How, how did you say it just now, Kieran? Bur it's Buran, I thought. Buran. That's how I've always heard it pronounced. Me All too. Right, then yeah. I just decided to All do right, whatever right. I wanted. Galley behind us. Buron. Buron. All right. Buron. Buron. All right. We Buron. Have three. Hey, so are you. Buron. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Moving Buron. <laughs> oh, this one. Oh, man. Really? Archetub? Archetub? Archetub. Uh, off of YouTube says, who would bet on reaction engines or escape dynamics? Both. Next. Yeah, I would agree. No, I, I so, well, so. Uh, uh, it, it, I bet on in what? Like, it, what, only one can be successful? Because uh, I, I don't they think can that, only be it's one. not they a. Can be, oh, no, I, I don't think so. I think they will both be successful. I think yeah. it's, it's, it's a matter of time for both of them. Now, which one will happen first? I don't know, right? Uh, Reaction Engines, uh, which does the. Um, the Skyline. Stage, Skyline. I'm like, single stage to orbit, big, huge plane, looks awesome. Skyline. <laughs> the sky <laughs> Plane. Uh, <laughs> um. They've been working on that for a long time, and it doesn't really look like they're 
closer at this point. But no. Um, and then Escape Dyn Dynamics hasn't been working on it as long, uh, but they're kind of they're they're the microwave like uh, using microwaves to uh, basically fly propel. a rocket, propel a rocket, yeah. and. Um, I got, would you still call it a rocket? A spacecraft. A craft. Microwaves are propel craft. That's propulsive. Craft. And I think they have different um, challenges. And so I can't. I, I have no idea which one will be first. But I have little doubt that both of them will at least make things. So there you go. All right. Yeah. Next up. This one comes from Nathaniel Decker. Ha! Ah, Novateco. 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 Off of Twitter. Uh, tomorrow, 8.34. I can't manage to get excited about reaction engines since they've been in development hell for so long. <laughs> Is that changing? <laughs> <laughs> well, they have been. Um, actually, it goes to my last point, which is they've, they've been working on this engine for a long time. A, a, it is an air-breathing engine that switches to a rocket. That's kind of awesome. Yeah. Right? So, um, I, as far as I know, no, that's not changing. They're, they're still in kind of the development yeah. cycle. I mean, also, you have to think, Skyline's a big thing, too. It's not an itty-bitty little thing, I mean. No, but, you know, if they open, I don't, so I don't understand exactly how all of this works together politically, but if they could open, not open source, but if they could sell the engine to other companies, for example, I'll just throw out, Virgin Galactic, mm -hmm. they might be able to use it on some sort of different craft yeah. that maybe takes a slightly different approach to what they're doing. Skylon in and of itself, a single stage to orbit is neat, but maybe that's overly ambitious for the beginning. So if we can take mm -hmm. that engine and drop, it's the Saber engine, right? So d take the Saber mm -hmm. engine and drop it in a less demanding vehicle, maybe we could see something quicker. Yeah, that would be great. Also that Saber engine too, I don't know if they've ran it for a long period of time They have well. run it though. They've I run mean, they it have and they've made it. They bent metal they've and they've made it actually work. made fire. Yeah, but so. I don't know if they've ran it for as long as it has to run for. Yeah, that's though. kind of a big so, deal. Yeah, yeah. a little bit no of a problem. Either. All right, and but. finally. From Brandon Mark off of Reddit. Next time Space Mike's feed disappears, <laughs> you could totally use something like this in his place. And next up, uh, <laughs> <laughs> South Park, huh? <laughs> It's uh, fairly accurate. Uh, Mike seems to no, like it. You should put that. You should put that back there. Put that back there. If you can. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh. Hey, everybody, it's Space Mike. I'm here reporting on some space stuff. You ready? Let's get into it. <laughs> That's awesome. So today there was a rocket that launched from China, and we're gonna go have a really great view from that. Ready? Roll footage. <laughs> <laughs> That's our show. <laughs> no. so it's pretty accurate, yeah. I'd have to I'd be okay with that. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, everyone, so much for watching. Uh, stay tuned. After Dark is up next. If you're a Patreon Plus or above subscriber, that will be available to you immediately upon posting. For everyone else, it'll be available in about four weeks or so. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next week.